Do you want to improve your training? Do you want to be clearer in your communication with your dog? Do you want to improve your techniques and just up your game in your chosen dog sports? Well, if so, today's podcast is going to be for you. Hi, I'm Kamal Fernandez, world-renowned dog trainer and dog sports coach, where I'm going to be talking about reward-specific markers and location-specific markers, or shortly known as RSMs and LSMs. You're going to find out all you need to know about what they are, how I came about to use them, and how they're going to be a game-changer for your dog. today's podcast talking about reward specific markers and location specific markers. I recently did a conversation and you can check that out on Karma Fitness Podcast with Chris Curtin, the wonderful Chris Curtin, uh, GB Teams uh, fitness coach, talking about all things to do with dog training and we specifically gravitated to reward specific markers and location specific markers. Since that podcast, which I'll share in the link um, you or in the bio, in the description, I'll share that information with you. Um, I definitely have had loads of people reach out to me for information to really really understand how reward specific markers and location markers are going to affect their dog training. So I'm going to take you down a little bit of memory lane as to how I came about them and to give you some insight into how they make a difference in my training today. So it was probably about 10 to 15 years ago, I'd say closer to 15, that I was doing what I always do, trolling the internet, looking for uh, ideas about training dogs. And I'm a dog training fanatic, as you'll find in these podcasts. And I love to learn about dog training and improve my understanding and see if I can be better and clearer for my dogs. And I stumbled across two trainers that were using RSMs and LSMs. The first one was Fanny Gott from Sweden, phenomenal agility trainer, who was using the concepts of reward specific markers to distinguish different placements of reinforcement and types of reinforcement she was delivering to her dogs. And further to that was Shade Whitesill, fellow faculty member of the FDSA Fenzie Dog Sport Academy, who had been successful in IGP or Schutzen as it was previously known. Uh, or IPO as it's previously known, it's many changes of name. Um, And Shade was using reward specific markers with her dogs in bite work. And that was something that really, really resonated with me. At the time I had a German Shepherd that I was training um, to hopefully do IGP with. And I really wanted to take a uh, a positive or reinforcement based approach to training that particular sport. And as a result, I was searching for people with ideas of how I could implement uh, uh, those techniques or the principles of reinforcement based dog training into a sport, which requires the dog to be in a heightened state of arousal and an extreme drive. And also, uh, and in a sport that has a large culture of using um, traditional dog training. So I sought out these um, these fellow dog trainers and I started to think about and consider how and where I could use reward specific markers with my dogs. And it was like a lot of things that I do in my dog training. Initially, I was a little bit skeptical and cynical and questioning, is there any purpose in me differentiating the different reinforcement markers or the different different delivery of reinforcements um, to my dogs? As opposed to what I was doing at the time was using one um, all-consuming marker word that didn't have any specific uh, rewards attached to it or reward placement. So at the time, I was using win, and that would mean to my dogs food or toys, it could be thrown, it could be placed, etc, etc. And I was having a level of success with that approach (coughs) with my dogs. And um, that was working really, really great for me. But there was definitely something that I felt was missing. And often I would note little behaviours or skills where I felt that the dogs lacked some fluency or they were questioning or there would be a period of where they had to create clarity for themselves. Uh, and unpack some of the information. And our aspiration for our dogs should always be to be clearer for them and to hopefully be more concise and um, efficient in the information that we give them. So 
I, as I said, I was trawling the good old internet and I came across these two trainers who I really felt had stumbled across or created something that could really be uh, impactful in my own training. So I started to play around with the concept of just distinguishing between food and toys as reinforcement. And that I could see immediately the impact on my dogs in that I could instantaneously affect not only their arousal, but create clarity. And this is purely anthropomorphizing. And when I had the, um, the dogs at the time, they definitely had a preference between toys and food. Um, I had a series of dogs, a boxer, a border collie, um, a German shepherd, um, a Malinois, all around that time period, who I knew had a preference between toys or food. And it depended on the individual dog. I also had my spits at the time. And, and he was very, very food motivated. So when I would mark him and present a toy, he would have what I would describe, and this is, as I said, it's putting human emotion on dog's behavior, but I would feel like he was disappointed by the reinforcement. And I, there would be a moment where I had to convince him that, yes, you did it correctly, you have got clicked, you have done the correct response, oh, by the way, you're having the reinforcement that you're not particularly uh, enamored by, which would be a toy in his instance. He would play, but not to the degree that he really, really loved food or still loves food. So um, that was the first little bit of clarity I created for my dogs. I removed that level of, oh, oh, is that what you've presented to me? So that was really, really, really impactful for them and instantly created more clarity. So when they um, did a behavior, they did it correctly. I distinguished between food and toys that immediately improved the performance of the behavior because the dog could predict the pattern that was about to uh, take place. So that was a really, really um, interesting um observation of using RSMs or LSMs or reward specific markers. I wasn't <coughs> using location specific markers at that point just yet. So I started to just work on using the two things, distinguishing food and toys. And I would start, certainly if anybody's thinking about using RSMs or LSMs, start there. Just distinguish between food and toys. Don't try and overwhelm yourself with all the various reward placements. Stick to those simple principles of food and toys. Um, so once I'd started that with my dogs and I was playing around sort of, um, uh, you know, sort of in uh, my private, really, my private training, I wasn't actually teaching it to this point because I wasn't sure about the impact and I didn't want to use my students or my, uh, my, yeah, my students and my clients as guinea pigs for something that I wasn't actually 100% convinced on. So this process <coughs> moved forward. I was playing around with these things with my dogs and um, I got uh, my boxer, Punch, who uh, I wanted to again do IGP um, with and um, I started using them from day one with him, distinguishing between food and toys and different reward placements. So I start to introduce taking the toy from my hand, which for me is strike. I also introduced throwing of the reinforcement, which is chase. Uh, and I had so four, so food, um, toys, <coughs> throw, grab from my hand. I had four marker words. And I could instantly see the clarity it created for him. And I started to then, as you do with reward specific markers, add more to his repertoire. Um, so I also introduced a box clicker, which meant when he was doing protection work, I could give the control literally or uh, to the helper and they could communicate with my dog. Um, which was something that was really important to me because I wanted to be away from the dog. The handler had that relationship where they could create clarity for the dog, mark the dog for specific behaviours and be able to deliver reinforcement to them or to him. So <clears throat> that worked really, really well. And I was doing, as I said, with this with my own dog and working away in the background, trying to train him as best I could, as we all do. And it was actually one of my students um, who came to me with a very specific problem. She'd been training with me with a, a, a giant schnauzer called Fingal. Uh, her name's Mari. I'm not even going to attempt to butcher her, her surname. Um, but she had been a long-time client with Fingal. And she was actually going to compete at the World Championships in uh, IGP with um, uh, with Fingal. Um, and she, as I said, we, we, she trained with me since he was literally the second day I think he arrived in the country from being um, imported. He, uh, she brought him training with me uh, and I was coaching them along the process. And there was two specific problems that we encountered with Fingal that we tried lots of different ways to remedy it, but we just couldn't communicate what we wanted from, from him or what we wanted um, in that specific moment. And that was certainly, that was one was crabbing on heel work, which was one behavior that we just couldn't, um, we couldn't eradicate. And he was a powerhouse of a dog, a really phenomenal dog. And he was very willing and very clever, but we just couldn't communicate to him what we wanted. 
The other reinforcement or the other issue that he had was um, the bark and hold exercise, which is a, a part of the IGP test. And he was always conflicted about um, when he was barking and hold, when he was doing a bark and hold in the hide. So that's the tenth thing for those of you that do the IGP. One of the requirements is the dog to search out the helper or the decoy or the criminal, depending on what sport you partake in. And they the dog has to bark at them for a period of time. And then the handler returns to the dog and the dog is called away from that, per, uh, the helper and so forth and so forth. And the test ensues. And he had a consistent problem and, and it was due to distance. And he, sometimes when he was really close to the helper, he would be what you call dirty. So he'd have a little bite or interact with the helper, which would be a deduction of points. So he was going to the World Championships. He'd already qualified, but we knew that this um, issue was bubbling away with him. All these two issues. And I suggested to Mario, look, we've got nothing to lose. Why don't we try the use of reward specific markers um, to see if we can fix these two problems? And we'd been trying various things for you know a vast period of time uh, and with no significant change, we would improve it a little bit, but nothing really, really connected with that dog and made him have that aha moment. So I made the suggestion, I said, look, you know, the I, uh, ISPU or the, the championships are in X amount of time. We might have time to turn this around. Well, certainly we've got nothing to lose. You know, you're going to go into the championships with these issues. So we might as well see if we can work on it. So we implemented two reward specific markers. One meant the dog to turn away from us. So do a U, I call a U-turn where the dog would turn anti-clockwise away to get the reinforcement behind him, thus creating his bum coming in. And the other one was um, the distinction between um, the toy being taken from the helper or thrown to him. So strike and chase. And that we, we worked on the clarity of those those uh, markers. So we effectively taught him three markers, but it was to deal with two behaviours. And what we'd battled with for a considerable amount of time, in one session, he improved, I would say, 70%. And l long implementing it, it was a massive, massive, massive improvement. And it really... Um, jumped out to me how powerful RSMs and LSMs are because this is something that we'd, we'd worked on for a, with a clever dog that wanted to work. He was very driven, very, very trained, very focused, but we just couldn't work on these two little details. Um, and within one session, we massively improved it. So that was really the, you know, the final sell for me, the final um, thing that really pushed me to embrace the concept of reward specific markers and location specific markers. So since that time, I've implemented loads more with my dogs. And what it has given them is a massive amount of clarity. So if I go back to how I used to train, which is the use of one generic marker word, the dog would have to figure out what the reinforcement was and that the, the dog would often have an emotional attachment to or emotional state attached to that reinforcement or an arousal state attached to that reinforcement so for example if i use my generic word win and that could mean toys food um you know throwing food etc my dog is gonna if it's a high drive dog they're gonna anticipate the best reinforcement coming for them i.e a tug toy if it's a low drive dog, they might anticipate, uh, you know, or a food motivated dog, they might anticipate the food. And when I present the opposing or the opposite reinforcement, that's going to affect the dog's arousal state. Either they're going to get frustrated or they're going to lose interest or uh, maybe question it. So when I use a generic marker, not only does it affect the dog's emotional state because there's a level of, oh, I didn't get the right reinforcement. And that can either lead to potentially the dog losing confidence or the dog getting frustrated because they really, really want a certain reinforcement. And it, the bigger thing is that it's definitely going to affect how aroused the dog gets. So if it's a behavior that I want and I want the dog to remain still and calm and thoughtful, using a generic marker that has previously been conditioned to mean toy or higher level reinforcement, that could create a, a level of arousal that I don't necessarily want for that specific behavior. So what that does is it creates an ambiguity to the training and there's a level of gray in the dog's understanding so the dog now has to work out in a split second from when it hears the marker which reinforcement you're going to give them for dogs where you require speed that's going to deplete the speed because there's a thinking element involved and also what it can create is um conflict in the end behavior so for example if you're trying to train the dog to have forward focus if you mark the dog with a generic click 
and that has previously meant the reinforcement comes for you you're going to get a slight checking in when you really want commitment forward so you know if you use a generic term get it what does that mean to the dog does it mean get the reinforcement from your hand does it mean get the food does it mean get the toy does it mean get the toy from the floor does it mean get it from behind you what does that mean to the dog so that was a really, really impactful um, lesson for me to have. And it instantly created clarity for my dogs. Now, moving forward, um, I also started to think about location specific markers. So telling the dog specifically where the reinforcement was um, coming from uh, in relation to them or where it was positioned, I could tell them. So I can have a reinforcement marker that tells the dog the reward is on the floor, which for some situations and instances, that's really, really um, uh, helpful. It might be the reward is coming um, behind or de being delivered behind them so that or it's already behind them. And I have a reward also in my hand and I can discriminate which reinforcement I want the dog to have. So, for example, with an exercise like distance control and obedience, I can differentiate between the reward going behind the dog <coughs> um, to maintain the dog wanting to maintain distance or to keep that criteria um, reinforced and and aware in the, uh, um, sorry, um, present in the dog's mind. Um, but I also can have the reward from my person. So I don't then lure the dog's correct response because the dog's only going backwards or remaining in that position because the toy's behind them. So it means I can fade a, a potential lure very, very quickly. So I've got the advantage of being able to control the dog's emotional state. I can fade the presence of a reinforcement very, very quickly so the dog doesn't become dependent on it. I can also influence the behavior much quicker. So if I'm trying to create uh, a very specific behavior, let's take agility, that's where I would say absolutely reward, use reward specific markers. And I'm trying to teach the dog to do a wing wrap. Um, I ultimately want the dog to jump nice, or you will want the dog to jump nice and tight, close to the wing and then accelerate out of that. So the most uh, obvious place to reward the dog would be at the base or near the wing to keep the tight criteria or the tight turn criteria. And then I want it to power out. So the obvious place to reinforce the dog would be to have it chase me. So I'm balancing those two things out. Now, if I use the generic get it, um, is the dog to predict that the board is on the floor or is the dog going to predict that it comes from my person? So in doing so, there could be either uh, the dog could question, hesitate for a split second. It might be fractional, but those fractions of seconds truly do matter in the elite level of competing in agility. Similarly, if the dog um, powers out, if I have a dog that's predisposed to say herding, are they going to flank on their way out? So that's another thing that could be baked into the behavior. By using my reward specific markers, it avoids that two issues becoming uh, a problem. The dog starts to predict the pattern of when I do a wing wrap, sometimes mum or dad will throw the reinforcement to the floor, which for me would be puck it, or sometimes they would say to me strike, which means get it from my hand. And the dog can now reliably predict that either of those two things are going to occur. So which means they're going to maintain their tight wing wrap criteria and accelerate out. And depending on which the dog is more predisposed to, so if you have a dog that's really great at turning, but doesn't have enough drive out, you would reward more from your person to encourage power. If you had a dog that had a tendency to turn wide, you would reward primarily on the floor and occasionally have them drive out to balance that out of the, um, the picture. And again, you can play around with those, the ratios of um, floor or from your person, depending on the dog. So that's just an example of where reinforcement specific markers and location specific markers can absolutely impact the behavior. So the way in which my training has evolved is teaching concepts prior to teaching the behavior. And I'm going to talk about that in another podcast to come. But certainly reward specific markers and location specific markers are two things that I would absolutely implement into your training if you want to see clarity. So if we thought, take a protection sport, for example, whether it be IGP or Mondio, we are sometimes asking the dog to uh, uh, bite the decoy sleeve or the suit where sometimes I'm asking them to ignore them to come back to us sometimes we're asking them to focus on us but not make contact and there's a lot of points where there's conflict in what the dog wants to do what we've conditioned i.e lots of value for the sleeve but we also want them to understand in this moment I don't want you to touch the sleeve so reward specific markers are going to help distinguish and create clarity of the dog of saying I want you to look at the sleeve at this moment, the reward is coming to you. So that's going to create a distance. So there's no need for you to goal hang or pressure the decoy to try and grab the sleeve. In other instances, when you do a really consistent bark, I'm going to cue you to strike, which means come forward and grab the sleeve, which can then keep the dog in a nice, comfortable distance. 
Alternatively, I might ask you to do barks in the, the bark and hold exercise. I might throw a toy behind you and that way that deters you from coming forward or it might be on the floor. If I had a dog that I wanted to reduce the height of its jump, it was becoming too excessive or too hectic. So there's loads of ways that you can use reward specific markers to work on technical details and also ensure and prevent the need of using um, uh, corrections or reverses or punishment to create clarity. If we think of something as simple as a bite of a sleeve, okay, or a bite of a toy, the most predictable or the most popular technique to reward the dog for the release of the sleeve or the toy is to give them the rebites. So the premise being that the dog learns, the sooner they release the toy, the sooner they get to bite the toy. Now, dogs are very good at predicting patterns. So the pattern becomes release, sorry, bite, release, bite, release, bite, release. The dog then isn't stupid. It soon works out. There's no point releasing. I might as well hang on to it because I'm going to rebite in a second. So it becomes not a point of conflict about the dog releasing it actually becomes an anticipation problem. Then what happens is people misread that, they think the dog is refusing to release, it's actually an anticipation of the rebite, and before you know it, you've got conflict in both. So a much more effective way to create a clarity and keep the dog, so for want of a better term, honest, is to differentiate how the reinforcement is delivering to the, being delivered to the dog. So, for example, you would cue the dog to bite. Strike would be the word that I would use. I would say out. I would then say chase, and I would throw the reinforcement for the dog. So the dog now has balance between coming forward and also driving away and switching between fighting the decoy and chasing the toy. So prey uh, and and fighting the fighting aspect. If you want to get a bit more technical. Alternatively, I could say to the dog, out, snack, and I could feed the dog in position, or I could say out, yip, which tells the dog to come to food. So I can keep the dog guessing about what the reinforcement is. So therefore, the dog is going to maintain the criteria of releasing more reliably. That's the hope. Um, and the intention is to create um, clarity and make the likelihood of using a punisher, whether it be a no reward marker or anything else, less likely because the dog is going to be more clear about what I want of them. So just a couple of examples of where reinforcement specific markers and location specific markers can really be impactful and helpful for your dog training. If you're training an obedience dog and the dog has a tendency to work forward, the obvious place to reward them is behind you. Now, if you're using your body language to reward the, or to create that happening, i.e. turning slightly and manipulating them, the dog could become reliant on the body language and the body language is what creates the dog holding the correct position. Alternatively, if you turn into them, the dog momentarily sees you being forward. So as a result of that, the dog's still having value build, um, being built for the um, front of your body, which is counterproductive to the dog remaining back in position. So using a reward that says go behind you or saying go backward is a great way to encourage the dog to want to remain in a better position if you have a, uh, a dog has a tendency to work forward or forging. Um, if you have, you know, if you're, you're transitioning from an obedience dog, this is one of the ways in which I use it, uh, reward specific markers, when my hand can be on the hip and I want to transition to my dog having a focal point under my arm, I can use a reinforcement to initially use that as a focal point to reward the dog, but I can now put that on a reward specific marker. So when I transition to fading that reinforcement, I can use my reinforcement specific marker, which for my dogs is pit, as in armpit, and I can lift my arm up and throw the reinforcement from that position. So the dog, even though there's nothing there, the dog now is being conditioned to believe that there is reinforcement available from that location. So lots of different ways that you can use them that will massively affect not only the understanding that your dog has, the clarity that your dog is going to have, but also the arousal state. So if we're thinking about, let's just say you have a dog and you're doing, an, you want to do obedience with the dog and you're trying to train a duration sit, whether it be for stays, if you have, still have them in your test or for distance control or a sit weight for a recall or the endless places that you need your dog to sit solidly. So if we were to click the dog and use our generic click, what is the emotional state the dog's going to be feeling? Is it going to be aroused in the anticipation of a tug game? Is it going to be aroused or excited? Is it going to be, you know, a bit edgy because it's anticipating the reward coming forward? For me, a much more clearer way to reinforce the dog would be back in position. So I want to create a predictable pattern to the dog again. So I can say snack, I can come back and feed the dog in position. So now the dog very quickly learns not only to remain solidly in that position because they know the reward is going to come to them, 
I can very, very quickly build up duration because of the use of um, that consistent word. Now I have other markers. I have duration markers, which again is going to be talked about in a forthcoming podcast. But using your reward specific markers is going to massively create clarity for your dog where you can tell them reliably that the reward is always going to come to them. So therefore, it's more beneficial to remain in that position. So just a couple of ways of using them. Now, one of the biggest things that people say is, oh, gosh, I'm going to get confused about all the words. Start simple, start with just food and toys and then grow that to more words once you're comfortable and fluid. It's like using a new language or starting to learn a new language. When you first do it, just start with the basics, yes and no, and then expand it from there. Also, the other um, counter argument for reward specific markers and location specific markers is people feel that they're not necessary. And that could be the case. Well, if I've marked the dog, I might not want to be predictable in my reinforcement. Okay? And that's something that you might want to consider. For me, it's all about clarity. I don't want my dogs to question in the moment where, what and how and why the reinforcement is coming to them because I want them to absolutely know. That's going to ultimately create clarity, confidence and a better end behaviour from the dog. So the dogs that I've used reward specific markers, I would say their performance is more fluent, clearer, they learn it quicker because they start to predict the pattern much easier. For example, a duration stay, I can teach in one session with a dog that understands a duration signal or a reward specific markers that means food's coming to them very, very quickly, as opposed to previously, it would take uh, you know several sessions to get the concept going. But the, the, the level of clarity, the way in which the dog earn, learns, and how uh, impactful it is, because that language can be used in anything that you train. So just some musings there about reward specific markers and location specific markers. If you're interested in finding out a little bit more, go to my um, uh, bio on Instagram or my website, and you can find out a little bit more about location-specific markers and reward-specific markers. I hope that this has been an interesting podcast for you. Have a mull about it. Have a play around about it. Mull it over in your mind. Think about whether you're going to use them, how you're going to use them, what words you're going to use. That's another um, conversation point. But what is the marker words that you're going to use? Make sure that they're clear. Make sure that they're very distinct to the behavior that you're or the, the reward that you're delivering. So my preference is not to use generic terms like yes or good because we use them too readily in conversation. And I want my marker words to be really powerful and clear to my dogs. Have a think. Have a play. Let me know how you get on. Enjoy whatever you're doing and remember, enjoy your dogs and to continue to lift others up.